Uh, my name is Don Kerwin. I'm with the Center for Migration Studies of New York. That's where you all are today. And we're here to talk about reform of the U.S. immigrant detention system. Before I introduce our panelists, I, um, I wanted to take 10 minutes or so to provide some background on this system, particularly for those who may not be familiar with it. My former agency and Michelle Mendez's current agency, the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, started working in immigrant detention centers 18 years ago. And this room I know contains lots of people um, who have worked for many years, I think longer than we'd like to admit on these issues. At the time that clinic became active on detention, roughly 80,000 people were being detained on any given night. That number's increased to nearly half a million people, excuse me, 80,000 per year. That number's increased to about half a million per year today. Detention is often treated as a pillar of the immigrant enforcement system, something like border enforcement. Um, but in fact, really, it's a means to an end. And that end is to ensure that non-citizens appear for all of their removal proceedings, and if they're ordered removed, that they're actually, um, they can be removed. And in fact, detention makes it many times more likely that they will be ordered removed because it makes it far less likely that they'll be able to obtain legal counsel to negotiate them through the removal proceedings. Moreover, the purpose of detention can be accomplished at uh, far less financial and human cost through community-based and supervised release programs. As the American Bar Association, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and other groups have concluded, the basic standard should be that persons in removal be placed in the least restrictive settings or programs that will reasonably ensure their appearances. In other words, detention should be a last resort, not a default option. Yet in 2013, the United States spent $90 million on alternative to detention programs of a $2 billion detention budget. So if you look at the math, for $90 million, it had 22,000 people in alternative programs, and it had 34,000 per night in detention centers. So obviously, this um, alternative idea is a more cost-effective idea. I think it's really hard for people that aren't familiar with detention to do justice to the historical problems that have plagued the system. One of my, one of my own worst memories was the, um, when, when I was with Catholic Legal Immigration Network and one of our, we were informed of, a, of uh, sexual abuse of women in the basement of a jail. And it was actually a jail in which we were doing work. And we didn't know, nor did anybody else know, that there were even women in that jail. And it showed kind of how, um, how difficult it is to deal with some of these issues and how out of control this system was at that time. Earlier this year, CMS with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops released a report on the detention system. And let me give you five quick findings from that report. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about a database that we've been analyzing of everybody in detention on one night in 2012. And that night, I think, is September 25th, 2012. So we have a database of everybody that was in custody then. Kind of the five points I'd like to make is, first, the Obama administration's initiatives to reform the system have involved some very committed people and have involved some good reforms. And it's been a good faith effort. Um, that said, these reforms have been seriously undermined by the decision to open massive new family detention centers for Central American refugees and migrants fleeing violence. Over the course of 2014 and 2015, the family detention system grew from around 100 beds to several thousand beds. In addition, administrative reform can't and it won't lead to a truly civil detention system. In fact, the number of detainees has increased during the period of this reform over six years. The second point is that there's an underlying anomaly about the detention system, which, and this anomaly was actually the impetus for the detention reform efforts, and that is that nobody in immigration detention is actually serving prison time. Rather, they're in civil removal proceedings, or they've been ordered removed and are awaiting removal. 
Yet the overwhelming majority of detainees are held in prison-like facilities subject to standards of confinement that are modeled on standards for criminal defendants. Most of those in detention have criminal records, but high percentages of the so-called criminal aliens have committed immigration-related crimes. In other words, they've illegally crossed the border or traffic-related offenses, or other misdemeanors. Only 9% of the total population in the data set that we looked at for 2012 had, had been convicted of violent crime. Third, although immigrant detainees are not serving time, in many ways they're treated more harshly than criminal defendants are. Virtually all criminal defendants receive judicial custody hearings shortly after their arrest, by contrast, 75% of immigrant detainees are mandatory detainees and they don't receive custody hearings. There's now bipartisan consensus that criminal prison populations need to be reduced. However, members of Congress still continue to insist that every detention bed be filled every night. And this recently came out that contracts with private prisons actually provide for payment for mandatory minimum number of beds per night, whether or not those beds are filled. That operates as a real incentive um, uh, to fill those beds, right? That operates as kind of a de facto quota. Third, more than 85% of removal cases now don't involve immigration courts at all or involve them in only a cursory way. I think this is a very important and surprising finding. These include expedited removal cases, reinstatement of removal, administrative of removal, stipulated removal cases. For years, a number of groups, including our own, have documented due process deficiencies in immigration court proceedings, but most removal cases now receive virtually no process at all. In the 2012 database, we're seeing this trend start to appear in a more substantial way. Fourth, detention information systems are inadequate. In the 2012 data set, there were around 2,000 detainees for whom there's no record of whether they've been ordered removed or not. Okay, no record of that. And yet this information is extremely important to know in determining eligibility for release. In fact, release is required. Deten indefinite detention is prohibited in cases of people that have been ordered removed. We found that 4,200 people on that particular night had been in custody for more than six months and more than 1,500 had been in custody for more than one year. So there's a lot of long-term detainees in any particular night. And then fifth, by 2012, we're seeing the takeover, I don't know how else to put it, of the detention system by for-profit prisons. Roughly 16% of the detention beds on that night were in privately owned facilities, but around 68% of the beds were privately managed. Okay, so it's almost 70% of the beds were, were uh, managed by for-profit prisons. Of the 21 largest detention facilities by population on that night, and those 21 held 50% of detainees, 90% of the beds were privately managed. So they're particularly um, involved in these very large facilities. And our guess is, in fact, our informed guess is that privatization has increased very significantly in the interim. We were also concerned with reports on the aggressive advocacy by for-profit prisons for restrictive immigration legislation and for increased detention. It seems like the federal government with taxpayer dollars has created a permanent lobby for detention, which ought to be troubling. And for all of these reasons and for more, our report proposed replacing the current system which relies heavily on detention and custody with one that minimizes the use of detention and maximizes supervised release, case management, and community support programs. So that's the introduction. And let me now introduce our expert panelists who I'm delighted to have with us today. We wanted to um, ground our discussion in the reality of family detention. This is the, this is the issue that's the most immediate problem right now. And Michelle Mendez, who's directly to my right, is the perfect person to do this. She's overseen clinic's work with the CARA Pro Bono Project at the Dilly Detention Center in Texas. CARA is a joint project of clinic, uh, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, RAICES, 
and the American Immigration Council, and she's going to speak about how the U.S. came to resort to the mass detention of children and young mothers fleeing violence in Central America, a really kind of shocking response to that situation. And she's going to speak about what a fundamental problem this is and what needs to happen now. Michelle is going to be followed by Mark Dow. Mark's a freelance writer who wrote the definitive book on immigrant detention that was published in, 20, in 2004, and that book is called American Gulag, Inside U.S. Immigration Prisons. And Mark will speak about what's changed and what hasn't in the 10 years or 11 years since American Gulag was published, and what needs to happen to reform the system, which is our theme today. Judith Green with Justice Strategies on my far right uh, is going to follow Mark. Judith, Judith is an acknowledged expert, widely published on criminal justice policy, and a, a particular expert on prison privatization. And she's going to speak about a particularly egregious example of the intersection of the criminal justice system and, and the immigration uh, enforcement system. And that is the arrest and prosecution of ordinary border crossers who are then imprisoned before returning to the Department of Homeland Security for removal. And last but not least, we're very pleased to have Susan Burke join us today. Susan's bio reads that she, quote, specializes in bringing federal class action or mass tort lawsuits to reform broken systems or to fix societal problems. Boy, she's come to the right panel, I've got to say, and she's come to the right place. Her suits have frequently involved abuses by government contractors, including suits uh, regarding the KBR burn units in Iraq and Afghanistan, other misconduct by Halliburton and its former subsidiary K KBR in other cases, by CACI, which I think you pronounce Khaki, which is the defense contractor in the Abu Ghraib torture cases, against Blackwater for the Nisor Square Massacre, and against telephone companies for overcharging charging federal prison inmates. We're really pleased that she's here with us today to share her expertise and perhaps to provide some thoughts based on her extensive experience for addressing our immigrant detention system. We have three hours. We're probably not going to take three hours, to be honest. But we've asked each of our panelists to speak for 10 or 15 minutes. And we'll then devote the remainder of the time to questions and to a discussion with all of you. So thanks for being here, and thank you to our panelists. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Mendez with Clinic, for short, because it's a very long title. So my work in detention actually started in 2002, right after I graduated from college. I worked at the CARE Coalition, Capital Area Immigrants' Rights Coalition in Washington, D.C., that uh, visited detainees in Virginia primarily at that point. Um, from then, I went on to law school. I knew that this is the work that I wanted to do. And uh, thereafter, I did a lot of work on detainer policies and 287G, combating the 287G uh, jurisdiction. In Maryland, we had one, luckily just one. Uh, secure communities, and I had a lot of clients during all of those fights. Um, in particular, I do want to know because they're women, so it kind of it, it, it shows the evolution kind of into family detention uh, is not is not really that uh, that hard to see from 287G secure communities and these other programs. So 287G, uh, one of my clients was just arrested for eating a sandwich behind where she worked in Frederick County, Maryland. Uh, we were able to get her released on her own recognizance, which was great because that allowed her to then go on uh, to a Fourth Circuit case, and uh, she's doing well, luckily, and she's with her family. But 287G targeted her for no reason. She's outside eating a sandwich. I also had a client whose 13-year-old daughter called Prince George's County 911 um, for the police to arrive because her mom was getting uh, she was the victim of domestic violence. The police came and arrested both the stepfather of this 13-year-old girl and her mother, and she was subjected to secure communities. Luckily, prosecutorial discretion did work in this case because they did a motion to suppress in that case, which is kind of an overlap of criminal and um, immigration policies or strategies. So I, it was no surprise to me, to be honest, unfortunately, when I heard that after all the work that advocates had done in Hutto, 
to close that down. On June 24th, the government opened a temporary facility in Artesia, New Mexico, a deserted desert town where there were 10 attorneys total, where it was located hours from a city with an airport. So the volunteers, mostly through Ayla, who went, had to drive after they arrived for three hours and then be in this small town. So that facility did not actually have a contractor in, in it. It was just ICE directly, right? And it was designed really to deport rapidly within 10 to 15 days the women and the children who were there. And d they did succeed, unfortunately, to do that with a couple of plainful of, of women and plainfuls of women and children, unfortunately, before ALA volunteers, attorneys, uh, is ramped up the, this effort, this response effort. So it was run directly by ICE, like I said. And everybody cheered on December 15th when Artesia closed. But the cheering didn't really last too long because after Artesia shut down, it wasn't as if family detention went away, right? We now have what we have in uh, Dilly, Texas, and in Carn City, Texas, and then of course we have Burks. Uh, CCA, which is Corrections Corporations of America, is a contractor at Dilly. And GEO is a contractor at Carnes. So when this happened, when this transition from this temporary facility in Artesia, New Mexico, run directly by ICE, went into the contractor privatization uh, model in Dilly and in Texas, we joined forces, we being clinic, joined forces with AILA and American Immigration Council and RAIS, as hence the CADA Pro Bono Project. It's the acronym for all four of us. We're, we're very creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we decided to join forces because we are up against something really big, right? And we weren't, we're not going to do it by ourselves. If, if each organization does this by themselves, then we're not going to get anywhere. We all really have to come together. So we decided to join our resources, join our efforts, join our brains, and respond. And so we decided to fund, Zing Clinic has a, two contract attorneys right now in Dilly to provide services and to represent the women that are in Dilly, Texas. Now, Raices, our local partner in Texas, primarily works for the women who are in Carnes City. And so that's how we've kind of broken it up. It's the same type of model that we have seen at Artesia, where the vol there's volunteers on a weekly basis who come, who help for a week, and help along with the staff members who are there, based in Dilly, Texas. Um, help them represent the women, do all the interviews, credible fear interviews, etc. Hopefully a lot of you kind of know some of this background. Um, but it's a long story, so I won't be able to get into it today, so hopefully you can look into that. But currently, right now, we have three on-the-ground staff at Dilly. We have one funded by AIC, which is American Immigration Council, um, and then, like I said, our two attorneys. We also, this summer, had an Immigrant Justice Corps fellow who was great. And, uh, and we really thank Rachel Tevin and, and her outfit for helping us with, with the fellow a scene who was wonderful. Um, but it's just three people, sometimes four-ish people, who are down there right now to respond to this. And what did we see initially? So when I was down there in February, late February, early March, what I saw in Dilly, Texas, you know, it didn't look that bad. It didn't look that bad from the outside. And what they really present when there's tours of people who come to see it, it's like Halloween, right? Put on your best costume. And then once you take off your costume, you see really what it's like. We saw really high bonds by DHS, really high bonds. They couldn't pay, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. Um, and then the Denver immigration judges, because at that point, it was the Denver immigration court that was doing the teleconferencing of the, of the hearings and had jurisdiction over the women at Dilly, they were also setting the bonds really high. So they weren't really lowering the bonds by too much, not, not, not a lot. So at most, maybe 5,000, but we were seeing maybe from 5,000 to 10,000. In fact, one Denver judge, as I observed that day, um, in actually a couple of days, would not set it lower than what the woman paid the smuggler. Because if the women could pay the smuggler $7,000, then they could pay the U.S. government $7,000. Let alone, you know, that they've used their $7,000 all their life's work, everything that they've ever had. 
So there were very few releases on um, own recognizance or ankle monitors at that point, February, March, those months, April even. Uh, there was a suicide attempt, which I, many of you probably heard about. Uh, it was kind of awkward because I, I remember meeting the woman and she was having so many interpretation issues at the court and not understanding because nobody was explaining to her the process and this is before the CARE project got up and running with her folks on the ground. And next thing I know, she attempted suicide mm. uh, after I left and I had to read about it. There were no electronics that could be brought in, no computers, no, no iPads, no way for our volunteers to really do meaningful work. Cell phones are not allowed search your bags, you have to go through the monitor. So we didn't get any privileges for access to counsel as attorneys. And we had a lot of denials of our volunteers. So we still have this, which I'll talk about what's still persists and which doesn't. But we have to submit these pre-clearance forms for everybody who goes to the facility. As attorneys, we should not, we should not have this stuff. As legal representatives, we should not be subjected to this sort of thing. Interpreters, they're subjected to more rigorous standards, okay, fine. Um, but we had a lot of those issues, and that was actually reported on. Um, Political reported on two of them in, in June. And only then were they allowed into the facility that Thursday and Friday. So half their week that they were there to volunteer was gone. So then what happened? Well, we, um, and what we're seeing now, um, but what happened then was that there were lower bonds set by the Department of um, Homeland Security and by the Miami judges because of course by the way why while we had already kind of gotten used to the Denver judges and how the Denver court operated within a week's time not even we were told never mind we're gonna change jurisdiction to the Miami court now you're gonna have to work with the Miami judges and learn all of that we had a whole system in place in Denver with, with pro bono law firms and then we, we, we never found that again unfortunately in Miami because it's we were talking with Carmen earlier before, some places are just better with pro bono than other places. And Miami, unfortunately, we haven't found that. So lower bonds by DHS and by the Miami judges, which are great, unfortunately, erroneously requesting a lawful permanent resident or US citizen sponsor in order for you to be released on a bond, that's completely ultra virus. There's no requirement for that. Um, that we can't still bring bring in our cell phones, that exists. Um, that we can now, we are not allowed to bring in crayons or coloring books for the kids because it's considered contraband. Uh, there was a time there that there were lights that were left on at night on purpose because the CCA guard decided that he, the regulation said that he needed to see the residents, as they call them residents, not inmates, right? That'd be, that'd be bad, it's, it's residents. 24-7. Um, so that was making the kids be sleep deprived. The next day they were either not going to school or not paying attention to school and then they were getting in trouble because they were falling asleep. Um, we also have now this, this thing that's come and go with some of these issues are like zombies. You think they're gone and then they resurface again. We have these um, little pieces of papers that the women are given to screen handwritten notes by the CCA guards saying court 1 p.m. And the, the women are like, what is this? I have court today. I didn't know I had court today. A lot of anxiety to women who are, by and large, very traumatized already from past events in their home countries. They go to the court trailer, and it's actually a meeting with an ERO agent who wants to know um, if she's going to definitely take the ankle monitor or not. Um, so these kind of coercive strategies that they're using that whenever we talk to ICE about it, we're told that it's CCA not understanding the the rules and being rogue or whatever. So of course you see that there's this like buffering that occurs whenever there's a contractor in, in between. So now the women are really are being told you are going to get an ankle monitor no matter what, you're gonna be released because now women are being released but they're being released on an ankle monitor but they're being told you're gonna have one and don't worry about asking for a bond for, for an IJ to review your bond because it's gonna take two months and it's gonna be set really high anyway which has actually not been our experience. So the women are being dissuaded from seeking a bond um, and they're just getting the ankle monitors which pose a lot of problems. And we have more denials of volunteers. We now have two attorneys who have been denied for reasons that are still a little bit odd to us. And in the middle of all this, you know, there's a Flores litigation, right? And you guys probably heard of this. And we thought that this might be some type of a death knell to family detention. 
in some ways, um, we were hopeful. And we, as a CARA project, we got a lot of declarations. We mounted quite the attack in, in as far as contradicting some of the information that had been alleged by the government. Submitted those declarations. We thought it was great. Um, and then we get the order, and superficially, quickly skimming it, you think it's a really good order. You think that Judge G is, you, is really on our side, and I think mean, she is. It's not that she's not, but like you think, okay, we won the day on family detention. But if you read the paragraph um, that now the government has latched onto, we are less um, encouraged. And that paragraph says, a class member, remember a class member is a child. A class member's accompanying parent shall be released with the class member in accordance with applicable laws and regulations unless the parent is subject to mandatory detention under applicable law or, or after an individualized custody determination, the parent is determined to pose a significant flight risk or a threat to others in national security and the flight risk or threat cannot be mitigated by an appropriate bond or um, conditions of release. And then there's some other language about um, if there's a surge or if there's an emergency type of situation. So um, it's given a little bit of an out to the government, some of the language that's been added to the um, order that wasn't there before. So we're not as hopeful that it's going to have as much impact um, as, as it should. Um, so what are the current statistics? Well, the good is that we've assisted now through the project 5,000 women since the project began. Um, and we saw about 140 women in just the past two days. And generally speaking, it's about 100 women a day. 100% approval rate for merits hearings. That is to say that our volunteer attorneys and our on-the-ground attorneys who have represented these women have obtained for them asylum, withholding or removal or cat, some type of actual relief. This really contradicts what we have told, we've been told, that these women have no actual relief, that they're not actually refugees. And this week marks 329 volunteers for the CARA project since, like I said, the start March or so. Uh, the bad is that the total population is nearing 2,000 at Dili, and again, I'm speaking specifically for Dili because our work is mostly in Dili. Um, 2,000 women at Dili. Dili has a capacity of 2,400. So you see, we went from having fewer than 1,000 women right before the, um, Judge G's order to now being up to this amount. So you, it also makes you wonder, like, where, is, where are the changes happening? Um, families are also being separated. So what we're seeing is, and this isn't really something that we're talking about too much, but it should be talked about, is that women and their kids are being separated from the husbands or from an older child, a male child, uh, we just had, unfortunately, a BIA deny a stay of removal for an older uh, son of a woman uh, who was detained in, in Atlanta, even though the mom and his younger sister are now somewhere else because they've passed their <coughs> credible fear interview and are happily out of detention. But she passed a credible fear interview. Meanwhile, he's going to be deported. He's been separated, and he's going to be deported. We're seeing a lot of erroneous, false, whatever you want to call it, um, CBP notations, Customs and Border Protection um, notations, like they're coming to work on children's paperwork. They're two years old, they're four years old, they, they are not coming to work. That, didn't, that wasn't present for a while and now it's coming back. Like I said, a lot of these issues are like zombies. We think they're gone, but then they come back. Um, asylum office is supposedly set to ramp up to 100 credible fears, RFIs, per day, including Sundays, which is going to throw our project into a, a, a loop, actually, because we want our on-the-ground staff to get some time off. And they, too, can suffer from PTSD and, and some of these ills, right? So we worry a lot about that. Um, but right now, we're seeing actually about 50 credible fear interviews and uh, reasonable fear interviews. But it's supposed to ramp up to 100. We'll see if that actually happens. So right now, um, the negative credible fear finding and request for review following a negative credible fear. That is supposed to happen with the immigration judge within seven days. It's not happening within um, seven days because ERO is not transferring the case in a timely fashion. And so what the information that I was able to get from EOIR, which is to say the, the Executive Office of Immigration Review in Miami, the judges, that they have run the data and they are well within the seven days in Dili 
they um, are whenever they get the actual case from ERO, they do it within six days, within that seven-day review. But ERO is just not keeping up and keeping up with the regulation, keeping up with what they're supposed to do, and so they're not sending the cases off to the immigration judge um, so that the women can get timely access to the judge and then hopefully get re get released sooner than later. So there are very few IJ bond reviews right now, so very few judges are reviewing bonds right now. Why? Because most of the women are being told, take the ankle monitor, that's your only choice. And so they believe it, and then they take it. Um, and ICE officers are apparently also complaining that we are instructing the women incorrectly about the differences of, of ankle monitors and bonds, but that's because we've we got to tell them their choice. We have to tell them this is your choice. As attorneys, as legal advice providers, we can't not tell them what their options are. So um, clients report that ICE, like I said, is telling them that it's going to take them two months to get a bond hearing and that the bonds will be set at 10000 if they take the risk of seeing an immigration judge for a bond. Um, and of course, the women want the bond because if it's a low enough bond, they want to pay that and just be released without an ankle monitor, right? They don't want the ankle monitor because of all the stigma and all the um, discomfort and other issues that are that pertain to an ankle monitor. Uh, medical treatment, I could spend a whole afternoon talking about this, but I just want to flag that these are very uh, serious issues, and I think if there's anything that really underpins what the rest of the panel is going to talk about, why family detention does not work and why this really should not exist, is because the medical uh, treatment provided to the women and the children has just been in our experience at porn. They are being told take aspirin and take water for very serious illnesses. Our folks have had to previously call 911 for a very sick child, which I believe had, I believe had a pneumonia um, and was very, very ill. Uh, and so the, they're waiting maybe seven, five hours. Well, one of the cases was up to seven hours to see a doctor when the child was sick. So very long waiting periods to actually get medical treatment. And, um, you know, as if all of this isn't enough, we now have reports that there are scams to the family members. So there have been multiple families who have been called by somebody telling them, I have your wife's information, I have your friend's information, her name is this, the A number is this, and the A number is correct, and you need to send me $1,600 so that she can be released, and when you do that, then we can release her. So they're posing as immigration officials, they have the information somehow, which begs the question, how did they get the information? And so we now have families that are being defrauded in this way. And that's to be expected when you have a system like this, right? Uh, what's the future of family detention? Well, um, it seems like Dilly and Carnes are on their way to becoming a temporary holding facility, right? That's what the Flores litigation is telling us. It's not going away 100%. It's just going to be a temporary holding facility through which women and children are probably going to be processed through on ankle monitors. It's a big money maker, and the rest of the panel will talk about that. It's a big money maker. And the problem is that this, the women are just not being released quickly enough. So I don't know how it's how it's happening that these are just going to be temporary holding facilities when there's no capacity for ERO to actually release the women as quickly as they should be if they're going to comply with the Flores order. Um, this is the bad news that uh, we just learned today, which actually has me a little bit, um, uh, yeah, just a little bit upset. It, so I had a phone call from somebody in the ICE ERO custody programs about a week ago telling me, oh, can, do you know any, uh, any community-based organizations, nonprofits in the DC area that some of our folks can go observe because we are implementing this family case management program as an alternative to detention. And we want to have some of our ERO officers go and look at a CBO, a community-based organization, nonprofit, that deals with a case management holistic program so that we can learn from them. Initially, I thought, oh, this is really good, you know? And then I get the, the realization of, of what ended up being announced today. Um, so this program was supposed to focus on providing particular vulnerable um, immigrant families with intensive case management services so that they could navigate through the immigration process. So a maximum of 1,500 families at a time with approximately 300 families in each of the five targeted areas of one, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., two, Los Angeles, three, New York City, Newark, 
four Miami, and five Chicago. So it's a pilot program that is to start by the end of the year, and we were very heartened to know that some of our uh, very committed and great um, allies, such as LIRS, um, had been had went gone for these bids, um, and we were really hoping that at least they or somebody that cares in a, and is on our side really could get one of these bids, especially so that we could compare the treatment with that type of case management with somebody like Geo. Well. We were just told today that GEO got all five bids. So that's the future of um, family detention, it seems. It is temporary holding facilities, but at every potentially awesome, different, innovative, visionary, compassionate alternative to detention, there's still this presence of CCA GEO and a for-profit prison corporation and I'm sure it was a sort of lowest bidder kind of thing, but we see what the lowest bidder does when we're talking about human beings and human lives. And it's entitled actually Geo Cares, um, to make it sound nicer, because you know names matter. Um, so the bottom line is, is that it's, we haven't seen any humane, uh, or not as humane as it should be, as it could be, treatment of the women and the children who by and large, like we said, have been traumatized and do have cases because we have a hundred percent rate of of winning their cases before the immigration judge. So, hi, um, I want to talk about the limits of immigration detention reform, and in some ways, I'll be zooming out a bit to talk about things that were uh, implicit. In, in the situation that Michelle is describing. Uh, I want to begin by uh, talking about a couple of TV shows that I watched, though. Um, there was an episode of The Good Wife in which Alicia Florek, <coughs> excuse me, um, can't find a client. She's not familiar with the immigration system, and she has a rare immigration case, and her intrepid, street-smart investigator says, ah, they play a shell game with them. There's an episode of a show called In Treatment in which the Varick Street Detention Center, which a lot of uh, immigration advocates don't even know about, um, is mentioned by name. And last of all, there's an episode of Damages with, with Glenn Close, which I strongly recommend. Um, in which someone decides that instead of filing criminal charges against someone, they're going to file immigration charges against them. And the reason is that, quote, then we can keep them away from their attorneys as long as we need to. The reason I start with these is because these particular aspects of the immigration system um, used to be hidden away in human rights reports read by nobody except the group that's in this room right now. And now they've become plot devices in TV shows. And I think part of what's going on here is that the system of secrecy around these issues has worn away um, a lot more than some of us thought was possible. But looked at from a different perspective, these aspects of the system are actually more entrenched than ever and are taken for granted. So I'm going to tell you my conclusion in case I run out of time. My conclusion is that the immigration agency should not be running a <coughs> detention system, period. And I thought of different ways to explain this, and then I looked on ICE's website, Immigration and Customs Enforcement's website, and they give the reason that they shouldn't be running a detention system in one sentence. The sentence is their teaser, their quick description for the 2009 immigration detention reforms, and it says this. This is ICE's own language. These reforms address the vast majority of complaints about immigration detention while allowing ICE to maintain serious immigration enforcement. 
So I teach literature, we do a lot of close reading. I'm going to just read you this sentence again and ask you to listen to the two halves of it. These detention reforms address the vast majority of complaints about immigration detention while allowing ICE to maintain serious immigration enforcement. What that sentence tells you is that as far as the mentality goes behind ICE culture, immigration enforcement and humane conditions of confinement are antithetical to each other. What they're saying is that somehow we're going to find a compromise between immigration enforcement and treating people like human beings. Those things shouldn't be a contradiction, but they are because I shouldn't be running uh, detention shouldn't be running detention centers at all. Seventy-five years ago, um, ICE, well, then INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service was moved from the Department of Labor to the Department of Justice. And the reason given for that by an INS, by the immigration agency's own history of itself, is that, quote, transfer to an enforcement agency was a logical step, unquote, in wartime. Fair enough. But today, because of that detention system's operation by an enforcement agency, what we have is the situation that Michelle was just describing in which guards are conditioned to view refugees as dangerous, quote, criminal aliens, unquote. And one of my biggest discoveries over the years that I was researching American Gulag came through conversations with detention guards who talked about the ways in which they were subtly and sometimes not so subtly conditioned to view anyone in their custody as a dangerous criminal. The problem with the 2009 proposals for ICE detention reform are that those reforms still rely on the immigration agency to be police, prosecutor, judge, jailer, and oversight of their own system. Um, something that we wouldn't and don't accept in the criminal justice system. A law enforcement agency cannot operate a non-penal housing system. So, to reiterate what Don said, we need to return to using detention as a last resort and I would add to that that there has to be an independent system outside of the Department of Homeland Security to monitor that process. Secondly, and I think this is something we'll talk more about as we go on, we have to change the 1996 laws. We have to go back to a campaign that used to be called Fix 96 and address the underlying reasons that so many people, such widening circles of people who live here um, are being sent into detention and into deportation proceedings. The day before yesterday, a group of women with the Puente Movement, based in Arizona, uh, began a march from York County, Pennsylvania to um, meet the Pope to address issues of detention uh, and immigration enforcement with him. The organizers and participants are DACA recipients. They're recipients of Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, and I think that this one action, among many, encapsulates some of the paradoxical situation we're in. Um, in terms of detention change happening, but in such a way that we could really see the limits of reform. The Puente March began at the York County Prison, as I said, uh, which has made a lot of money, as have many other county jails, as well as the private prison companies that we'll hear more about. Um, the York County Prison first came onto the map for most people um, in 1993, after the Golden Venture a ship, a cargo ship smuggling Chinese immigrants um, came ashore uh, very near where we are now in New York. A lot of these Chinese refugees were then held in jails in York County and a group of local activists uh, 
in a largely Republican community, I should add, uh, were horrified by what they saw going on in terms of not only the jailing of people who were refugees, but also what they saw as the exploitive system making money off of these refugees and the denial of due process to them. Um, it's worth remembering that at the time, the federal government was explicit about the fact that it was using detention in order to deter political refugees from coming, and also reportedly that federal officials were interfering with what should have been individualized determinations of who received asylum. Um, all of this uh, has continuity with things that are going on today. Now, in 2009, the Obama administration announced an explicit program of detention reform that some of us have referred to. Um, there was some striking language for those people who a lot of people in this room included have followed these issues closely. There was an amazing sentence in there which said that one of the problems is that the ICE jails are largely designed for penal, not civil detention. Now that's something that most of us knew already, but it was a sign of change, I think, that the administration itself, in an ICE document, was admitting um, that there was a contradiction between civil and penal detention. Um, on the other hand, I cringed the first time that I read an ICE document that referred to stakeholders in the detention uh, community. And the first time that I came across that was a document that was describing meetings between advocates who were fighting conditions of detention and the bureaucrats within ICE itself. And there was this terminology of stakeholders which suggested that everyone around the table had the same interests, um, namely prison management. I know someone who worked for a non-governmental organization until fairly recently, an organization that uh, most of you would have heard of, who was involved with meetings between immigration NGOs and federal ICE officials, and finally resigned uh, because he or she felt that, um, that, that what they wanted to do in opposition had really become a form of collaboration. And um, I'm aware that this criticism coming from me is from someone who is on the outside and writing about these issues and that there are difficult decisions involved. Obviously, you want to talk to people who are creating the problem. But I think that this dynamic is something that has perhaps distracted a lot of people from the more fundamental reforms that we need to be making. In the 19th century, Charles Dickens visited the United States, and one of the more famous things he wrote about that visit was a criticism of conditions that he saw in a prison in Philadelphia. He witnessed a system that he thought was shocking and dehumanizing. Uh, what he witnessed was a system of solitary confinement, which had been developed in part by Quakers as um, a form of prison reform. It was intended to isolate the prisoner so that he or she could spend time reflecting on his or her life and what he or she had done. Um, the prison what was considered prison reform, we now know was something else. And in fact, just this summer, the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, released a report calling for an end to solitary confinement in uh, jails for uh, immigration detainees in New Jersey. Now, obviously, Detention conditions can be good or bad. 
and good is better. I don't want to minimize the importance of dealing with those conditions. But having said that, a system that's designed for dehumanization cannot be humane. I'll have a few other concrete suggestions, um, but perhaps during the discussion will be a better time to make them. Thanks. So I'm Judy Green, um, and uh, I am um, part of a small, very small um, justice policy group called Justice Strategies here in New York. We work nationally, um, and um, the group is kind of, it grew out of my own career over 40 years, working mostly on criminal justice issues from a, um, my version of an abolitionist um, frame, which is like, to quote someone I don't like, shrink the system until it's small enough to drown in the bathtub. So, um, we got involved in, um, we work on masses, Mass incarceration and racial disparity, the intersection of those, the nexus. Um, and so in the, um, in the 90s, when the private prison industry had become such a powerful enabler, if not driver, of um, the prison boom in the United States, I got interested in looking at that industry. Um, and then um, over the same time, I became aware uh, partly because I was leading the private prison, the prison industry, but that, that the, um, the number of um, non-citizens behind bars was growing in this country. The detention system was shooting up. And so. What we do is um, focus our work on providing reports, for the most part, and information um, to feed the work of uh, advocates and activists um, as they work on issues of mass incarceration, incarceration criminalization of immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. So on the immigration side, um, we wrote in the mid, we published in the, in the mid-aughts um, a report um, that I co-authored with Arthi Shahani, who some of you may know, <coughs> founder of Families for Freedom, on 287G, and the report got modest citation around the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> um, Arthi went off to forge a new career and uh, I continued working. Uh, we work primarily with organizations that are engaged in trying to end the laws, policies, and practices that <clears throat> drive the problems that we're talking about. So I went on to work <clears throat> on secure communities, um, it, it particularly, or, it, a few years ago with Enlon, the National Day Laborers Organization, and the um, Asian Law Center in San Francisco, we worked on the Trust Act. We um, <clears throat> analyzed data that had been obtained by Enlon through um, litigation and put a price tag on, on the practice of county jailers holding people after the, their release date for ICE to come pick them up. Um, and, um, and we did that work for two years until the, until the Trust Act finally was enacted and signed by the governor. Um, we've been doing some work on looking at whether um, non-citizens are uh, getting the benefit of a small piece of the Rockefeller Drug Reform uh, Act, which says that you know if you're not a citizen, you're not to plead guilty to get drug diversion, so it wouldn't trigger a removal by ICE. Um, currently, we're very busy uh, working with a coalition of <clears throat> border action and immigrant rights groups along the border and civil rights, human rights groups um, to address a problem that I want to talk to you in more detail, which is essentially the criminalization of people for, as someone mentioned before, um, crossing the border without authorization. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, as I said, we, what we try to do is help um, um, activists and advocates target the laws and policies uh, and practices that give rise to these issues of detention, mass incarceration, racial disparity. Um, so it's not just, isn't it awful, look at that terrible private prison. It's like, well, what are we going to do and who's responsible? What, what elements are coming together to do this? 
So I'd like to just briefly talk about um, where I think I saw the beginning of the moral panic that we have today around immigration. Maybe not the beginning, but the, the beginning of a big ramp up, which was the passage of NAFTA in 1994. Um, it, it, you know, the, the, the government told us that um, this was going to be good for the United States and good for Mexico and so forth, and yet, you know, the annual per capita income after NAFTA was passed in Mexico essentially flatlined. Half the country lives in poverty. Um, Two million people have been forced to leave uh, their farms in Mexico because of the because the tariffs were lifted on corn and other grains. Um, basically, agribusiness finding a new market south of the border. Um, and uh, you know, after NAFTA passed. Um, Mexicans were moving to the United States for obvious reasons, economic primarily, at a clip of half a million a year. So, uh, you know, NASA really set the stage um, for the moral panic that we're all appalled about. That has given rise to a series in 96, the, the mandatory detention, mandatory removal acts. Um, the moves of the Bush administration in 05, which I'm going to talk to you about, to criminalize people for coming across the border. Um, and over that period, just in terms of detention capacity alone, uh, the detention population grew from uh, 7,000 people in, in uh, 94 to, you know, it quintupled uh, to the 30, more than 33,000 people that we have. So, you know, they knew. They really did. They told us that NAFTA was going to be great, but in, it went into effect January the 1st, 1994, and on September 17th, 1994, Janet Reno went to Los Angeles to announce the launch of um, a border crackdown, the beginning of the building of the walls at San Diego and El Paso. They knew what was going to happen. Um, and I want to talk about another area in which this, this uh, burgeoning crackdown on non-citizens in our country um, has, uh, you know, gives, breathed new life into what was around 1999-2000, a big um, a, a decline and, um, um, you know, financial crisis for the private prison industry. Um, and at a point in time, and I'm going to maybe come back to this issue again, or at least lay it out to you now. From my point of view, what this looks like, the, the increase in detention, the, inc the criminalization and incarceration of people for coming across the border, it's the drug war all over again. And the irony about that, the criminalization of people who used to be handled in, you know, in other ways if they had a drug problem. Or, um, and um, the irony of that is that at a point in 99, 2000, and whatever, uh, a number of us who work on criminal justice issues were beginning to hold our breath towards celebrating the leveling off of what had been a phenomenal increase of prison boom that started in the 80s and had taken this country into uncharted territories that we commonly call mass incarceration or the prison industrial complex. Whatever just at the point where we began to see a little bit of relief and actually slid into a few years of, of, of declining population, along comes what a war on immigrants with many of the same elements. So, and the private prison companies became very interested in that phenomenon. They saw what was coming. They knew they needed a new market. Um, and so they were pounding around, you know, in D.C. for, um, you know, a bigger share of the detention bed market. But at the same time, in 1999, the Clinton administration, which had passed NAFTA in 94, um, uh, came suddenly to realize that the federal prison system, the Bureau of Prisons, had been wrong all these years in refusing staunchly to get involved with privatization of prisons. Um, and uh, the administration launched a new uh, contracting initiative that uh, we come to call the CAR prisons. CAR, that's their lingo, they call it uh, criminal alien requirements, right? Wonderful sales phrase there. 
um, these, uh, you know, lawbreakers from another planet, right? Um, so, uh, in 1999, they issued the first solicitation for car prisons. They wanted to see two of them contracted in the Southwest. The private prison companies would have to build them, site them, build them, and then um, they're called Coco prisons also, at, uh, with contractor owned, contractor operated prisons uh, that were in the contracting unit at the, at the um, BOP. Um, the first uh, car prison. Uh, solicitations specified like California, uh, Arizona, New Mexico as possible sites. CCA was on the brink of bankruptcy. They really were. I, I wrote an article around the same time for the American Prospect detailing that they were on the brink of bankruptcy and then suddenly here comes rescue, bail out. Um, the uh, car prison proposal was, oh, there were five or six different companies trying to jockey for these, these contracts. Cornell Corporation talked the Board of Supervisors, whatever they call it, the county board in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, to lease them the old uh, main prison, which had been closed after the bloody riot in 1980. It was a decrepit building. Um, but when immigration advocates discovered that the county had done this thing, um, they organized. Uh, they, I actually was at the first organizing meeting, I happened to be in New Mexico at the time, um, investigating human rights abuses in, in private prisons, not immigration, but state prisons. And um, uh, it's just an amazing coalition came together really quickly and they had march, candlelight marches in the streets and they pressured the board. Within two weeks the board rescinded that, that you know, so there's no car prison in Santa Fe. However, within a matter of months, um, the BOP announced that they were contracting two car prisons, the very first two, to CCA, the company that was on the brink of bankruptcy. One of them in, in, in Milan, New Mexico, I think, which is what, 50 miles west of Santa Fe? And the other in California, a spec prison built on speculation by CCA, hoping they could get a state contract in California City. So, um, the, these, these two contracts alone for CCA were worth about $760 million over the past decade. So you get what money makers these prisons are. There are now 13 of them. On average, uh, between 1999 or, or 2000 and, and 2013, the Bureau of Prisons contracted one after another. The bulk of them really are still CCA prisons, but GEO is a big provider, and MTC got some of the business. Um, the, um, in, in 1999, before the um, initiative got rolling, uh, the Bureau did have, they had conceded uh, through intergovernmental uh, agreements, right, with counties in Texas um, to contract for prison beds, primarily for non-citizens. Um, and those counties had subcontracted to private prison operators, again, I think it was CCA, to operate the prison. So they were sort of... Uh, Private prisons slipping under their nose under the under the BOP tent. Um, today, uh, there there were uh, almost 5,000 people in those contract beds that were not ostensibly private prisons. Now we've got 13 that are cocos, pure car prisons, with 23,000 uh, people in them. Now I want to say something else about that. The Bureau of Prisons actually, almost a quarter, more than 23% of the prisoners in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, people convicted of federal crimes, are non-citizens. Um, and that's 48,000 people. Um, 18,000 people are the ones I'm going to talk to you about, people who've been, um, who ended up in prison simply for crossing or recrossing the border. Principally recrossing is when you get a prison sentence. So who are the rest of these people? 48,000 non-citizens and only. Hey, have you heard about the drug war? They are almost all doing time for drugs. I would just agree to float away on the nearest cloud 
if you immigrant rights people ever decided to help the criminal justice folks get rid of the drug mandatories. Um, and as some people here know, I've been pushing for a long time for the, the criminal justice folks, uh, advocates in this country to help deal with mandatory detention, mandatory removal. I mean, the mandatory word should be struck from our vocabulary. Um, so, um, the criminalization process, how many? Another two minutes. Two, let me say. Criminalization process largely was ramped up by uh, Michael Trudeau when he took over the Department of Homeland Security, uh, making use of laws mm -hmm. that had been on the books for a long time, US Code, uh, 8 U.S. Code 1325, which is misdemeanor crossing the border, meaning technically the first time, and 18 U.S.C. 1326, which is unlawful reentry. And that's what's filling these private prisons. Um, we actually have a little more, more capacity in the car prisons right now than there are people filling the beds. Um, and uh, this has given rise to something that many of you may have read about or heard about, which is Operation Streamline, which is what um, Chertoff kicked off, um, started it in uh, West, uh, the Southern District of Texas and then spread across the border. Um, in 2002, just 3,100 3, people were charged uh, uh, with misdemeanor crossing the border. Um, and in 2004, that number had, uh, had jumped to uh, almost 18,000. Uh, Last year, um, the number of misdemeanor uh, charges, or people charged with misdemeanors, was about 44,000. This is the most, uh, and, and then like uh, along the same parallel as misdemeanors started to pile up, felony uh, prosecutions of people for recrossing the border, coming in more than once because you have a family or your, you know, your economic circumstances are what they are, also burgeoned. Um, and at the felony level, where people are in conviction getting 17 months behind bars before going back to the civil system for removal, which is where people were sent before, you know. So it's like, uh, I don't know, in Europe they call this double punishment. I'm not, you know, but at any rate, um, I, I'm going to end, got a lot more to say, but I'm going to end by saying, um, by pointing out that another irony, which is that the Obama administration under Attorney General Holder, has taken the remarkable step a couple of years ago of beginning to wind down the federal level drug war, giving new guidelines to prosecutors about uh, you know, not, not pushing for the mandatories or even not filing for people who really should rather be in the treatment facility. So if you look at the number of people charged with felony crimes of crossing the border um, for Bush won, all right, George W. Bush, or George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, almost 900 people were charged the last year of, of his administration. For Clinton, it was 6,200. For George Bush, George W. Bush, Bush II, 18,867. And there you see the shirt off taking the grip. So what has the Obama administration done while they're winding down the drug war? Here comes criminalization. This is pure criminalization, people. I mean, it's they're taking people who weren't normally treated as criminals in this country and turning them into these, you know, monstrous criminal criminal aliens. Um, the Obama administration in 2013 prosecuted 33,938. So drug war, immigrant, immigrant war. Um, I think I better stop there, or Don will come and get his hook on. So I will. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Looking forward to your questions. Ms. Burke. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Burke. I am not an expert on immigration. I am just a regular trial lawyer. But I've become very interested in what I see as uh, a pervasive problem that has spilled into the, this particular topic. When I first began as a lawyer back in 1987, I worked for a large commercial corporate law firm. But there, as a pro bono project, we represented Mariel Cubans. As many of you who are experts in immigration know, there was developed this legal fiction that the folks that came over who were caught 
uh, and then they were released, but then they would be picked up again for marijuana or for a speeding ticket. They'd be thrown in prison indefinitely. And as a young lawyer, I, along with others at the firm, would go and we would represent these individuals. And it brought you face to face with the completely arbitrary, awesome, and distressing power of the immigration in our system. There's no domestic constituency. There's no one that really cares. So you're there fighting what back then was INS, and you're getting very arbitrary and random results. I mean, we would sit down after every session where we'd go into these prisons, and we would try to figure out why were we able to get some released? Why were others not? There was absolutely no analytical framework that was applied. It was completely up to the discretion of the individual panel, the, the person that was hearing the individual plea. And although after I, I stopped doing it, I went part-time and raised my children and I really stopped doing it, but I've always remembered and been struck by that terrible feeling I had of being so helpless in the face of that executive power. Fast forward into the Bush years and I became very active in trying to stop torture and I confronted the same type of situation in which you have an executive branch action that's wholly inconsistent with both domestic law and international law and they bring in private contractors. And you know, so there what you saw was, it was an e it's an easy out. You have executive branch malfeasance that is essentially obscured and covered up. Our system of government, the separation of powers, depends upon Congress being able to engage in oversight and hold the executive branch accountable. We have a system of the Freedom of Information Act that allows the public to engage in oversight and hold the executive branch accountable. All of that stops working when you outsource things that are inherently governmental. We can't get FOIA documents from these corporations. and even more perniciously, the money going to the contractors erodes the separation of power because it comes back in donations, right? The lobbyists and the corporate contributions to Congress then begin to eliminate what would otherwise be members of Congress making decisions based on public interest. Instead, the executive branch essentially begins to influence Congress through the money. So, and when we look at it, it gets even more direct. The money flows have got to be tracked and, and combated in order to get the, this urgent problem corrected. Looking just at the telephone system issue, which is where I've begun, there are embedded kickbacks. So a company, a company that gets the, the, it's a monopoly, right? They are the only company that's allowed to provide service to that particular detention center or that particular prison. What do they do? They promise what they euphemistically call a site commission, which is a kickback, right? You give us the contract, we'll give you 30% of what we are getting. So you're moving money from a central government pot to a local government pot. So you essentially have all sorts of ways in which this money flow changes what should otherwise be decisions made based on public policy. And I think the urgent question for everyone that would like to see the United States adhere to international law, that would like to see the United States truly be a democracy and treat all people with dignity, is what are the strategies we haven't used that we need to begin to use? And, you know, I think that that's the dialogue that has to happen. I know that, you know, over the years, Don and I have worked on different issues together. We're getting older here. We need to, we need to actually get this problem fixed. So I think we need to think more creatively about tackling directly these corporations, tackling directly the money flows. I think we need to start thinking about using the, com the fact that they are commercial enterprises. They are not the government. They, there is a big effort to try to cloak themselves in the immunities of the government. It has, uh, in, in the litigation that I've done on the the toxic torts over in, on, with Halliburton and KBR, as well as on the torture and the Blackwater cases. The name of the game is derivative sovereign immunity, right? They want to say, yes, we are actually a corporation making money. It's our fiduciary obligation to return an increase in profits to our shareholders. But nonetheless, you should treat us and give us the same immunities that the government has. But of course, you know, in the abstract, the government is given those immunities in part because they are assumed to act not for the maximizing of profit, but for the public interest. 
So I think that we need to start a dialogue and begin to discuss what other types of lawsuits, of protests, of, of organizing can be done in order to increase the costs to these corporations. We need to start thinking about shareholder suits. We need to think about, okay, someone gives a buy recommendation on GEO. Well, do they know of the sexual abuse that has gone on under GEO's auspices? That someone is awarded a contract. Okay, do we get involved in procurement litigation? Do the, do the procurement personnel know that they just gave the contract to GEO when they shouldn't have? So I think as advocates, we need to begin to recognize we're not, we're not just up against a, 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 the executive branch not doing the right thing. We have got to tackle the special role played by the corporations. And one thing I would throw out, one thing I was thinking about as I was getting ready to come up here is, okay, you know, the government has set standards on the length of detention. You have someone sitting in a private bed in one of these private prisons that exceeds that, false imprisonment. I mean, can't we begin to sue saying this is false imprisonment? Use the tort structure, use the common law to try to get at some of these practices. So I'm not here with anything other than questions and thoughts, but I'm very happy to participate. I do think that we've got to, uh, we've got to tackle the, the adversaries we confront now. And we have got to realize that, we've, that they are far out-resourced, but we've got to look at the fact that their weak link is that they are in fact for profit and that they do have accountability for making money. So we need to think about what raises, what reduces that money for them and what raises their costs. I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, all of you. That was terrifically interesting and powerful. Um, I usually ask a few questions, but I feel like I've I feel like I should turn it over to you all to ask questions and to make comments, particularly on, on this issue of what needs to happen now and kind of new strategies after all of these years of kind of dealing with the same set of problems uh, with this detention system. I, I was particularly struck by Susan's last point of the private contractors wanting all the benefits of being of government, but none of the none of the accountability and then all, of course, the profit of the um, being, a, you know, a, a, um, all of the profit of a for-profit corporation. Basically, none of the accountability to the common good is the way I would look at it. That's, the, that's basically it. But anyway, let me, um, let me open it up to questions, comments, particularly on kind of solutions, new, new approaches to, the, to this particular issue. We've done a lot of human rights reporting over the year. There's been a lot of, over the years, there's been a lot of good litigation. There's been good press work. This is kind of the issue that seems not, there's, and there's been some successes, okay? There's been some successes, but the trajectory, the overall trajectory hasn't been great. So, really, with this crowd, nobody has anything to say. I don't believe it. <laughs> and if you could just talk into the mic, we'd appreciate it. Hi, my name is Michelle Morick. I'm the director of Unanima International, which is an NGO at the United Nations. I was just sitting here thinking about the Syrian refugees and how we are agitating to have hundreds of thousands of them brought into our country as a matter of justice. But then I thought, what? We're going to put them down in the middle of this? Um, what would, what would happen? Or is this just the problem of the Mexican border? But does it apply to all, all immigrants? Let's hope it wouldn't happen to them. They would come in. They would come in as refugees, well, and of course we need to. And of course we need to bring in far more than the fifteen hundred that we yeah. brought in already. And. Uh, but they, it's conceivable, you know, they're, until they're citizens, it's conceivable that they could do something that would make them deportable, at which point, you know, it would apply to them. But, but generally, with this refugee population, that's not who we're talking about. I uh, really appreciate the work of 
the panel. And I appreciate all the work that has been done in your publications on these topics. I am not full-time involved in this kind of thing. I happen to be a Sister of Mercy, and I'm in a different role. I just heard about this, though, and I thought, I'm going to take a day off from my day job to come. Um, what I wonder about is, do you have any concrete ideas that you could show, you could tell folks that perhaps have funds invested in the GEO Group or the uh, Corrections Corporation of America? Should we be investing in them at all? And if we do, what are the shareholder, what kinds of um, what kinds of uh, actions could shareholders take? Do I need a step for that? Um, there have been, um, one of my mentors in this work, a man named um, Harmon Ray, based in Tennessee, which is the home plug base for CCA, well, you know, started trying to organize against CCA with, back in 83 when the company was formed. But he started, he was the first activist I know who bought shares in order to challenge the company. At, um, and his, he died a few years ago, but his work has been taken on by a wonderful activist, writer, uh, editor uh, named Alex Friedman, who started his opposition when he was a prisoner in a CCA prison in Tennessee. Um, so, I mean, someone mentioned, I think, Susan, you mentioned the, the issue of sexual abuse. Well, you know, uh, uh, Alex and some other faith-based groups uh, um, who do corporate responsibility work uh, go consistently to the board meetings. Sometimes we're down there having demonstrations outside where Alex and others are inside. Alex is repeatedly sponsored and failed every year. Um, on a res board resolution that um, CCA should do something about. A couple of years ago it was cited as the, as the CCA prison was cited as the prison with the highest rate of sexual abuse of prisoners. Um, and other, um, so the flag gets raised. There are also, um, uh, and they have been going back to work that I worked, uh, that I did with uh, student um, national uh, student organization um, trying to get colleges and universities to divest. Um, and that the target back then was CCA and the divestment scheme was to get them to kick um, Sodexo off their, the catering company off their, off their campuses because Sodexo had back then owned 10% of CCA. There's a, a national divestment group called Enlace, it's based in Portland. They've been pushing divestment ideas in many communities across the country. They work closely with labor and with, and with, um, with workers' organizations, um, immigrant workers' organizations. They work in the United States and in Mexico. Um, I was involved in a small way. I went up and, and ran my mouth um, in the successful divestment campaign this year at Columbia University. Um, really applaud the students there for and the, you know for facing down the, the trustees. Um, so those kinds of things happen and there need to be more of them. I think that from my personal experience watching this over what, 25 or 30, 15 years now um, is that it doesn't hurt the companies but it, it's, a, it's a wonderful method for educating the public and raising the kinds of issues that you know these corporations should be put out of business for perpetuating. So, so you would say that. So you would say it's better to sit at the table rather than divest to be there to be able to. Uh, make no, I don't motions. think either one is 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 shutting down the industry, right. and sitting at the table has not yet um, moved a single. Um, resolution that got the, the you know the bulk of shareholder votes that they they needed. Also, you may know that the that the the, the regulation SEC regulations about what you can bring to the table in that strategy are very difficult. You know, you can't walk in there and say you know trustees we should shut down you know this person or that person. 
but it's but it's an important piece of a large mosaic, which I would like to say more about of um, activism and advocacy that you know in a kaleidoscopic way have been has been growing um, you know since the late '90s in this country. Lots and lots of stuff going on. Hi, I'm Carmen Mackinon with uh, Catherine Charis of the Diocese of Radcliffe Center. Uh, my question goes to uh, Michelle and, and I think Mark, and, and I just want to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. What will be the alternative? I mean, we do know that uh, um, there are some um, immigrants that need to be incarcerated or, or need to be, the public need to be protected from them. Um, when we talk this way, maybe someone who is new to the immigration issue or doesn't or is not familiar with the immigration issue might think that it involves everyone. You know, no mandatory detention for anyone who is an immigrant when that is not what we are saying, right? So to me is what will be the alternative to on on cases where this needs to be? And just just to give you a little background. Um, even to this day, I would say, whenever someone talks about the Marielitos, it brings fear still to the ears of many people because the message back then was, if you're a Marielito, you are a criminal that uh, Castro emptied their you know, psychiatric hospitals to come and do damage to the United States or to uh, embarrass the president at that time. So um, just my thoughts. So I'll just address one small part of that and then um, pass it to Michelle. The, I think it's a perfectly fair question, but um, I think it misses part of the problem and that has to do with the way that the question of immigration and the question of being a criminal have been confused, and I should say confused intentionally by the rhetoric of, of administrations, including the present administration. Um, what I mean by that specifically is that with the 1996 laws, we have um, hundreds of thousands of people who are being detained and deported yearly based on old convictions, right? But that's not part of their criminal sentence. That is because they're non-citizens. And so I think that one of the things that, um, if I could just make one concrete contribution to how this discussion moves forward, it would be this, that those 1996 laws, uh, which by the way, Bill Clinton should apologize for. He's apologized for a lot of things, but uh, not, not for that. Um, part of the problem is that we keep addressing those laws uh, as if they have to do with immigration policy. And I don't think they do. That's not how I look at them anymore. Because when someone has been here for decades, and then we're sending that person away because they're a non-citizen for um, an old conviction. That really has nothing to do with immigration policy. What it actually is, is a second level of the criminal justice system for non-citizens. And I think that's an important aspect because if you, once you begin to see it that way, then it's impossible to lump it into the issue of strengthening the border before we can do anything else and that level of BS. And I would totally agree with that and I think John's first remarks are on point that detention should be a last resort for those who need it and like you said and your question as Mark said is fair some people commit crimes and you should you know pay the price for that crime or whatever I have issues with our non rehabilitative kind of and penalization of that um, that prison and jail has become because it doesn't really rehabilitate anybody unfortunately but is that really the aim that's another philosophical question and I think in practice we see that that's really not the intention um, but I think that 
that should definitely be the last resort. It would be great to have for these women and children who we're talking about right now for family detention. I don't know how that's even a question because they are refugees, they are seeking protection. They are women who have been raped, traumatized, have undergone some sort of violence. And again, these are children. So these are not people who don't deserve at least the chance and that opportunity. And I find it really interesting and we see it a lot in our in the national discourse right now and on the media, if I may kind of bring back some of Judy's points with the criminal justice system since I live in Baltimore and I love Baltimore, is that it just seems as if our country has gotten further and further away from giving minorities or immigrants a second chance. If you are privileged, you get that second chance. But if you are not part of the white privileged class, you don't, after your first chance, if you even get that, it's done. And um, I actually think that the, uh, the undercurrent of a lot of it is that we've lost a lot of empathy as a country. I don't know where that went. I don't know how to get it back. I'm very heartened to hear that there are some of my most empathetic friends who are having children because I'm hopeful that they won't pass on those values to them and that the younger generations will have that sense of empathy and that we'll be able to travel and have a you know, have more passports than any American before and be able to see other people. So, long uh, response to your very valid question. I'd like to respond to it. You remind me of the globalization of indifference with that line, you know, and hopefully we'll hear that next week. But, um, so here, I, I want to agree with both of those comments and put it in a different way. What, what we're talking about here is not detention. That's like a euphemism, and yet we use that all the time. What we're talking about really is prison. This is prison, you know? And we shouldn't, and the basic point here, at least of our report and of other reports, is that we shouldn't be imprisoning the super majority of those who are in removal proceedings. First of all, every single one of them has already gone, who has a criminal record, has already gone through that. They've already been through that. Um, and there's only a, a very small number of them that can't be assured, you know, if there's protection issues, that you can't assure protection. But it's really um, appearance at removal proceedings that they'll, that they'll be there with some level of supervised release and some, some kind of program like that. And why don't we want to imprison people? And here's, here's why. Because this is what happens in prisons, you know. And I'm listening to Michelle and I'm thinking, wow, things really don't change. This always... This is always what happens in prisons. Some judge comes around and he says, uh, I'm not going to set the bond, bonds lower than you know, what you paid the smuggler. There's always stuff like that. Or um, a lot of us remember kind of the, the one-way mirror in a segregated cell for people with mental illness problems. But it was put in incorrectly in the facility that a number of us went to, so that the authorities could see the detainee, or the, so that the detainees could see the authorities, but the authorities that were supposed to be watching people on suicide watch couldn't see the people inside. That's what happens in prisons. Or a number of us remember kind of the the loaf, and that that's where in one of the prisons, all of the leftover food was ground together and put in the refrigerator and baked the next day and served the next day to the detainees, you know. They thought that was a big joke, funny, you know. Or, um, or the rules about you can smoke inside this facility, but you can't smoke outside it, you know. I mean, it, it's this insane world, this kind of crazy world of prison that you're exposing immigrants to. Or coloring books are contraband. That was a, that was a good one. Or, uh, you know, a private corporation commits an abuse and its overseer says, oh, they just don't understand the rules. Or the private corporation um, head who runs the facility comes out with his overseer and they say, you know what, there's no space between us. There's no space between us. We're kind of all in this together. That's not the way it's supposed to work with private contractors. Or families being separated. Husbands put in one place, older sons in another kids getting bad medical care. How long have they been giving aspirin and Tylenol for serious medical conditions? It's been going on forever. So this is why it's hard to explain it. You know it, and, most, and a lot of people know it, but it's really, really hard to explain it for somebody that doesn't know this detention system, just how historically bad it's been, and how distrustful all of us are that it's going to get better, and it doesn't seem to be getting substantially better. I would just add the point Don made about the prisons are 
there is a lot of academic research that the Stanford experiment, the Milgram experiment, I mean, we cannot keep these prisons going. We know by definition, if it's a prison, there will be abuse, there will be cruelty. I want to pick up on that, but um, with a word of caution, um, those of us who have a foot in both criminal justice um, reform, sorry for the word, um, and immigration, um, as well as people who just principally work on the criminal justice side, are um, burdened by campaigns for immigrant rights or against detention or whatever that, that focus on uh, we are not criminals uh, because the implication is that all that bad stuff, the loaf and the lack of medical services and what is deserved by criminals, not by us. It, it, it's an impediment for us doing what we really should do, which be working together against mandatory anything, against horrible conditions, against locking anybody up other than for the, la the last resort. Just, I mean, just to, just to be clear on that, of course, I, of course I'm not in favor of anybody being treated that way, but I'm particularly not in favor of people that aren't serving time, you know, being in prison, being in prison, period. Mercy Global Action, which is an NGO actually set up by the Sisters of Mercy um, that does advocacy at the UN. Thanks so much to our great panel. Um, I have two questions. Um, one of them, I guess, is sort of a broad question that speaks to the nature, I think, of uh, the problem we have in this country with too much money in politics. Um, but it was, um, I'd just like to hear a bit more from the panel, and Susan in particular, you talked about some creative solutions to stop this cycle of um, government contracts going to private prisons for immigrant detention, and then that sort of the profit from that industry coming back into Congress to lobby for policies um, that criminalize non-citizens. So that's my first question. Um, and the second one is just a question of, um, just out of ignorance, I was wondering, Michelle, if you could speak a bit more about um, the ankle monitors, and if you're seeing this sort of um, progress moving from immigrant detention to, um, to processing and release uh, with the monitors, that'd be great. Well, I, um, on the question of the money flows, I mean, one of the things that we see in this arena as well as in the mercenaries uh, is that we have the executive branch contracting out the oversight of the contractors. And so what, and we don't have enough, we don't have enough attention on the lobbying dollars. It is actually able, it's data that is able to be collected um, the, and it, because the contributions themselves are are on public record, and you know, from my perspective, one of the things that I think is helpful to educating the public is to simply make those linkages. People don't necessarily know. Okay, well, you know, this prison industry has placed a prison in this location. Look at the money flows from these individuals. So I think that uh, in some ways we need to just continue to shine a light on this and use the data that's out there, but, but portray it in narrative form so people understand why it is that Congress is not acting the way that it should on some of these really essential issues. So the ankle monitors are being given to the women as a condition for their release. So that's how the ankle monitors are being used in Dillian, Carnes, and Burks, wherever. 
that you will be released, but only if you accept this ankle monitor. So that's what I mean by the kind of coercive tactics um, that have been used. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it just, what is, I just don't know what the purpose is of an ankle monitor. Yeah, so it's called an ankle shackle, ankle monitor, ankle bracelet. It's a GPS system basically embedded in the actual monitor. Uh, and it just, it just reminds me of what I was talking with Mark about on the phone the other day, which is like, just being, like, you being under somebody's watch all the time, like, being on where you are, like, there's something traumatic about that, too. There's actually been essays that have been written about the tra traumatic effects of, of that as a punishment. So that's what they are, and they will also check in with the field offices for ICE, ERO, wherever they are, um, or with BI, which is part of GEO, and I can tell you from experience, clients who've had an ankle monitor who report to BI and are part of also ICERO, um, that they're not treated well at all by these BI, GO folks. They are treated quite poorly, and they leave those check-ins, as they're called, traumatized again. So, and then I wanted to answer your question, I'm sorry. Um, so, <laughs> there are, there are schools, there are services, like I said, the medical realm is lacking drastically. There are services, but they're not adequate. In our assessment, they are not adequate. And I can give you an example of recreational uh, things that are given to the children at Dilly, which I said looks good superficially, right? But our attorneys on the ground, and this sticks with me, tell us that there is an Xbox and there are these things that the children can play with, but that instead the children don't play on the Xbox and don't play with these toys and don't play with these amenities that this detention center has for them. Instead they sit around and they talk about, what did the judge tell your mom today? Well, we got a $5,000 bond. Oh, does that mean you're leaving? And that's what kids in this facility are talking about. They're not playing with the toys. They are excited to know about what's happening in court with the immigration judge of what was the last hearing about. Do, Michelle, do, do the respondents have to pay for the ankle monitors? Isn't there some kind of money connection there too? The question is, do they have to pay for the ankle monitors? Uh, no, the ankle monitors are free. Um, <laughs> The bond is what is costly to them. So the statutory minimum for a bond is 1,500, and when we get the bond assessed by the immigration judge, they do come in at 1,500 from Miami. The Miami judges have been very generous with, with lowering that, that bond. Uh, but the ankle monitors, they get to take them for free. Yes. Hi, I'm Dick Erstead. I retired recently from a long career with the American Friends Service Committee working in international and U.S. programs. And, and um, this panel is, is it's really interesting, but it's also very discouraging. Um, you know, in, in my work at AFSC, I tried to marshal on the ground experience and expertise and research into collaborations on, on policy change advocacy, trying to get international or domestic coalitions together. And it appears to me that right now there's a lot of fragmentation and separation of issues and, and, and lots of different sort of small groups talking to each other. And, and I found very encouraging reading through the, the report issued by the Center about how to reform the immigration detention system. Um, I love Judith's um, advocacy for linking the issues of, of criminal justice reform and and what is the ACLU Pope Brothers thing all about? Really, um, how can we get beyond um, kind of this current fragmentation into some real serious advocacy work? I mean, I, I put a lot of time into looking at the new collective impact methodologies for uniting efforts of disparate agencies and trying to get them together to focus on a long-range change strategy. Um, this doesn't necessarily lend itself to something precisely like that, but I'd love to hear people reflect on, okay, 
yeah, it really sucks right now. Uh, what are we going to do? Is Pope Francis's message next week going to be a moment to kind of hang a, a new narrative out there, or will it just fade away in the, the buzz of Stephen King having sat on his hands in Congress for too long, um, listening with a grimace on his face? I, I, what's what? What do you think is going to be happening? What's next? Um, you know, there are a number of uh, really vibrant uh, national organizations that I revere um, uh, working on uh, many of these issues. The Detention Watch Network with their name and shame campaign targeting specific both public and private facilities. Um, the work that they and others have pulled together on the, the, the bed, um, turning the notion of the bed guarantee into a bed quota so that, you know, even Republicans can go, ooh, we don't like that. Um, and uh, grassroots leadership, the group that I work most closely with, who, who's uh, um, helping to uh, activate a whole network of organizations on the border, um, Puente, um, and their uh, uh, allegiance with uh, Enlon, the National Day Laborers Association. Um, on the political side, I would say, although it hasn't a uh, chance of a snowball and you know where in Congress, um, uh, Bernie Sanders is um, uh, introducing today the um, Justice is Not for Sale Act. Um, and it, it, it covers both criminal justice and um, some of the immigration issues that we're talking about. It would bar the federal government for contracting with private prisons to operate either as prisons under the BOP or as detention centers under ICE. Um, it uh, will uh, increase oversight to prevent companies from overcharging prisoners and their families for banking services or telephone services, and the requirement that ICE detain 34,000 um, immigrants, the quota, um, require improved monitoring of detention facilities, ending immigrant family detention, um, and on the purely criminal justice side, except it's not because remember the 38,000 people uh, who are in uh, f federal prison for drug crimes, not to mention uh, in state prisons for drug crimes, um, it reinstates the federal parole system, which is something that would benefit everyone alike, uh, anyone subject to a federal mandatory prison. So, you know, it, I'm hoping that he will really press this as a campaign issue that people, so between the Pope and, and, and Saunders, maybe we'll fire up some more vivid discussions around this stuff. Don't worry, I can't um, talk. Uh, my name is Susan, and I'm an intern with Humanity International. Just listening to you, um, so you just yeah, wait for just a second. Yeah. Here. Hello, my name is Susan. I'm an intern with UNAMA International. I'm very interested in the private contracting system, and I know you're not going to be able to give me an answer on this, but are there strategies and ways that can limit their power and limit the amount of money that they are getting through this system? Well, there's certainly nothing that uh, would be immediate unless something like that bill passed. Uh, I think as a practical matter, we have got to continue to bring suit when they engage in wrongdoing and continue to shine a light on the amount of money that is flowing to them. I think that the other, the other way in which we differ from other nations, for example, we don't have any sort of registries of people that have been found to have used excessive force. So what you have is you often have you know, someone who's been a mercenary who gets fired from a company because they engage in excessive force. They turn around, they get hired by CCA, and they're a prison guard. So I think one of the things that we should think about as a legislative strategy is whether we shouldn't begin to have nationwide registries so that we don't keep... It's, it's a, the population of of folks that are the guards and that are the mercenaries, it's it's not, you know, numbers wise, you could track that. So I think we need to press to get FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, expanded to the corporation so that we can get the data 
and we need to continue to press both through lawsuits as well as through legislation to get them out of this business. Uh, last night, I have two fast questions, I think. Last night, uh, if you listened to the show that was on, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, what was said over and over was, well, we've got to seal the border. We've got to seal the border. Now, my question is, do we know if the folks that are presently in these detention centers, are they newly arrived or were they people that were picked up after being here for years? Do, do you have information on that? Probably a mixture, I'm sure. So, Sister, you're asking specifically about Dilly, Carnes, and Burks? Right. Okay. So, Dilly, Carnes, and Burks are for all recently arrived. Recently they just arrived. arrived, they got right. picked up, and they got placed in these centers. Okay. And I should mention that there were women who were there since before Artesia up until recently. Right. Remember that Artesia was June of last year. Right, I remember that. So, there's something to be said, which goes back to the question here at the end, how that impacts a child who always sees right. The same tree, the same wall, the same kitchen, the same food for almost a year in their developmental progress. Can I say something? Um, I happened to be in El Paso uh, probably in two, early 2000, the El Paso, southern New Mexico area. I was working there. Um, and they wanted to put a detention center in Sunland Park, that was it. It was in Sunland Park, which is right on the border. It's a New Mexico town, but it was on the border. And long story short, a lot of people came out to the, I guess, the, the town council meeting. And the, the town council, after listening to people for two hours, they were all in favor of it in the beginning. After listening to people for two hours, they, they agreed we're not going to have it in Southern Park. I guess my question is, do when these things get built in little towns, in the dusty Southwest, do the people know what's happening? And is there an opportunity for them to weigh in on this? Um. Well, when a, uh, if, a, if a Bureau of Prison contract uh, spurs sightings uh, and companies come forth and say they want to build it in this little town, that little town, um, there's an environmental review and they have a meeting around that um, and I've never seen any of the opposition make a dent in the decisions made at the Bureau of Prisons at all in that regard. I can give you, um, you know, Probably more than a dozen instances of exactly what you said when people really get up in arms. But even more typically is, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the strategies the private prison companies uh, uh, use is to take a look at, back during the prison building boom, they would take a look at, at towns that had gone to the state officials begging for a prison, you know, economic development for our town, and they lost to some other town, and the private prison companies would run in and say, well, we'll, you know, at cost, the localities have to float the bonds. And there are other examples that advocates use of when localities float the bonds, and uh, the, the, the facility, the big tent um, um, complex, uh, in South Texas, um, at, in Willacy County, um, which was first an INS facility and it was run into the ground so badly that um, the ICE turned it over to um, the Federal Bureau of Prisons and it was still run so badly by a new, by the same company that finally the Federal Bureau of Prisons has ended the contract. And that, and, and those bonds are not paid. And that is probably about the poorest county in Texas and they're really stuck so there are you know you can you can hold you know instances like that up but for the most part um, 
because of the strategy for citing, both public citing and, and private, and principally since Chertoff came into the place and the huge increase in, in detention uh, beds took place, almost all of those beds were privately contracted. That's how we got to such a high proportion of people in detention in private beds. Before that, it was more of a split. Um, but, you know, they look specifically for these godforsaken little communities, dusty roads, nothing going on. Um, and so it's very hard, you know, to stimulate a, a level of opposition in those communities that would be affected. When you can do it, it works. It worked there. It worked in it was, Santa Fe. It was, it was like 200 people at the meeting. So, and, and I can't tell you about the inception of the South Texas Family Detention Center, as it's called in Dilly, Texas. But I can tell you that when I was there, trying to figure out where we're going to put this thing, like put our project back in February, I of course went in with the Catholic emblem shining um, because I wasn't sure how we were going to be welcomed, if at all. And people knew about it. We went to a real estate company, talked to the um, Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, and they're like, oh, you're, you're here for that. Okay, yeah. And so they all knew about it. The kind of heartening thing that happened recently to kind of go back to, is there any encouraging news on the, <laughs> on the horizon? Um, our, our team, our on-the-ground attorneys, and um, our advocacy uh, person was also there, and then our volunteers were eating at one of the very few restaurants, and they got a little note from somebody who was at the restaurant saying, Thank you for all that we do, you do to help all the immigrants um, and children, or something to that effect. I don't, I can't. I'm paraphrasing, but they are ultimately welcoming, and they're. I knew that using the Catholic emblem would help because even though they might say, "Oh, the illegals," in the same breath as, you know, you support your mission, it's you know, baby steps. And I, I just wanted to really quickly go, um, go back to. And just to quickly answer your question too, the, the fact is that oftentimes these uh, these contracts that states and localities enter with for-profit corporations are sold as something that's going to be very lucrative, and they don't end up being lucrative at all. They end up being a disaster for localities, and there's case after case like that. But I want to go back to your to your uh, issue on how disappointing we've been up here, <laughs> discouraging. <laughs> so, and. Uh, and I think, uh, and I want to lift up some successes because I think there have been substantial successes, and it's, and it's, you know, like Sunland and a lot of cases like that, but also like big successes, like the Supreme Court cases on indefinite detention. I think the, uh, I think there's been a big success on kind of the standards that govern most of these facilities now, even though those standards still aren't written into a lot of these contracts, you know, and they're in fact written into far fewer than we thought that they were, but nonetheless there's better standards out there now, and I, we, we owe the administrative reform effort to, to that in part. I think moving children out of, the, out of the control of the immigration enforcement agencies has been a, a good thing. Um, the success on quotas we talked about, the two family detention centers, what are they calling them now? Temporary processing centers? Or they're, trans they're transitioning to something else, you know? I mean, so there's the, there's the possibility of success, and there have been successes. I think the point that we're trying to, I'm trying to lift up in the report and others is that um, there does seem to be, there does seem to need to be kind of a fundamental reworking of this, though, that hasn't happened. And how do you do that? How do you make that happen? neuralgic changes, institutional changes, conceptual changes, whatever. And um, because right now it's still a prison system and there's still too many people on it. And there shouldn't be. And I think what I'd do maybe maybe four more questions and then we'll have final comments because I feel like it's a long session already, but you first. Hi, I'm Rebecca Sosa. I have a private practice, and I'm also with New York ALA's um, pro bono committee, so I do a lot of work with children. Something I'd love to uh, have the panel talk about is if you could talk about in, in numbers, um, how much does it cost per day, for example, per person, or how much uh, the average person who's detained, is there a range of, you know, because maybe the government says, oh, it's a short detention, and maybe the stats that you see could be six months to a year. So putting a, a sort of more tangible number on that, and you know we're all taxpayers, um, and 
voters. And um, so the economic arguments, in addition to the shareholder arguments, um, I think have a lot of traction when you compare what are we really paying, I and mean, it's the same argument in the private prison system as well in the criminal end, what are we paying as taxpayers, why are we paying it, is it because someone's eating a sandwich behind their building, um, as opposed to a serious, you know, as maybe the Donald Trump view, like a rapist from some, you know, from another country. Those are very different stories, and I think the more stories that I hear, the more I hear that it seems like such government waste, um, that not really, with unclear goals. So if you can talk about that, um, and then, if possible, if you can connect, I don't know if you've heard about um, a study, um, the only person I remember, his name is Mark Nofery, but he did a study about the, um, he talked about access to counsel, but perhaps um, a compromise, to tie in your point as well, perhaps one compromise if we as the taxpayers are paying for this is to pay for um, immigration um, attorneys to be defending these cases because the study that he did showed that that kind of system does in fact pay for itself if you take the, if you pay for counsel to represent these people, you're showing your statistics are fabulous of 100% win rates, um, they get released and the time that they're in detention is decreased and we as the taxpayers pay less money. And um, that to me is something I would love to hear um, and just open up to the group also to talk about ways to improve access to counsel and considering um, ways to require these um, private prison corporations to include that as part of their operating costs. Why don't we, why don't we take like four or five and then we'll, we'll respond to whichever ones we want. <laughs> Somebody will respond. Hi, um, my name is Will Coley. I'm a member of Detention Watch Network. And I think the thing that we've struggled with for a long time is how hidden this system is and that not many people know about it. And I'm just thinking, you know, since next year is 2016, it's going to be the 20th anniversary of IRA IRA that created this whole system. I'm just wondering, like, what are the hooks or how are you going to explain it to journalists so that they can run with it? Like, is it about un unintended consequences that, you know, we have a system that was supposed to be short term and now people are long term detained? Is it, what, I mean, how, what is the story that we're going to be able to get to pitch to journalists to cover this 20 year anniversary? And it's also the 30th anniversary of Reagan's uh, amnesty in 86. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting year. And you know how journalists love hooks around uh, anniversaries. So I think, I think it's the time is now that we should be thinking about that. Thanks. Um, Karen Gourzet from Washington, D.C. and the CMS board as well. I just wanted to respond to Sister's question a bit earlier about the distinction between whether people in detention are people who have been here a long time or recent entrants. One thing that we haven't um, touched on and that's left a lot out of the public debate, I think, especially when talking about, quote, illegals, and this goes back to Jay Johnson's message about um, deterrence when the, the um, influx started last summer is that there's nothing illegal about people coming to the border to seek asylum. Right. Some of the people, of course, entered without permission and were apprehended internally, but even they, within one year, have an automatic right to apply for asylum. But lots and lots of these people, the adults with children as well as the unaccompanied minors, many of them have been presenting themselves at the border, which is their absolute right to do. Now, they may not have travel documents, but that's not an illegal act. So one thing that I think we all have to be careful about is to not let this characterization of illegals take over the whole conversation about people's right um, to pursue remedies that are available to them. And for the children too, even the special immigrant juvenile status, that is constantly talked about, much too much at the state level by state court judges about, you know, being used as a ploy or some kind of device to circumvent immigration law. And it's exactly the opposite. It's built in to immigration law that state court judges are charged with making those decisions about whether children have been abandoned, abused, or neglected. And I think it's really important that we know the concepts, are aware of the language, and really push back on not only the use of illegal as a pejorative term, but actually substantively incorrect in many of the cases. This, I, I feel afraid my comments are going to be a little bit confused because I'm going back 
and forth on different things. One, um, I wanted to respond uh, to what you were saying, Don, about how you know we need to dismantle the system and point out that it's basically, you know, it basically exists to make sure people show up at proceedings. And it's something that I've been working on immigration detention. I'm Judy Rubin, it's from the ACLU. I've been working on immigration detention for like 25 years. So, and um, one of the things that there was a period of time that I spent a, put a lot of energy into and got nowhere was trying to see if we could get some kind of pilots to show that, you know, that alternatives to detention work. I mean, that case management services work. Because, you know, we don't want an alternative to detention thing, which is everyone's on electronic bracelets. And that's basically the statistics that we have right now are mainly from groups like Behavioral Initiatives, the private contracting, that uses electronic monitoring and other things. And so, you know, on one level, I think it would be great if we could interest some academics or foundations or whatever to do that, to do these kinds of pilots. You also obviously have to get buy-in from, from the government because otherwise, if people are subject to mandatory detention, how are they gonna try these out? I also think that there's concern that maybe they won't work. <laughs> I mean, maybe they won't work. I mean, I don't know, you know, and this is where I, I feel like when I say they don't work, it doesn't mean that I mean, people should be locked up. But in fact, one of the issues has been when, um, you know, when community-based organizations have tried to say, well, we'll do that part of it. They don't want to do the enforcement part of it, and I don't think they should do the enforcement part of it. But if somebody doesn't comply with the reporting requirements, the government was saying, okay, then you've got to make sure they show up. You know, and I understand that that puts the community-based organization in a, you know, weird position. And so, you know, you're representing people, you're trying to help them, and then they lose, and then, then you're going to turn them over. So this is where it then goes back to the more fundamental question, which I realize this, at some point this stuff gets too big to, to sort of handle, but like, why are we deporting people? You know, why are, you know, why are we deporting them? Why are we spending so much money to, to put people through this system, and don't we have to be questioning the deportation laws themselves? And that goes back to the 1996 laws that um, Will was talking about, and that you were asking how many of these people who are detained are recent arrivals, and how many are people who've lived here for years. Most of the people in detention are people who've lived here for years. A lot of them are lawful permanent residents. Lawful permanent residents who um, are allowed to be here, but then they committed a crime, they were convicted of the crime, they served their time, and now, while in other systems this might be considered double jeopardy, deportation isn't considered punishment, so now they're facing deportation. And in the past, prior to 1996, this was the case, but there was at least the sense of the, there was the law allowed for discretion, the law allowed for someone to plead their case and say, show me mercy, look at all the equities, it's been, you know, I've lived here since I was two years old, all my family is here, don't deport me, and they wouldn't be deported. The 1996 laws, basically, you know, pretty much stripped immigration judges of that authority. So that then goes back to, you know, Will's question, <coughs> is there some way to use the 20th anniversary of the 1996 laws? And I remember five years ago struggling, or six years ago, saying, we're coming up with the 15th anniversary of the 1996 laws. How much time I spent trying to talk to people and get people to say, can we do something? Can we do a study saying it's the 15th year? Can somebody say, what are the costs and benefits? How much, you know, what have we benefited from? How many families have been, how many families have been divided? How many kids have, you know, families have had to go on to welfare? I mean, I'm not saying that these, that these, this data is easy to get, but if we could get some social science researchers to begin to look at broadly, you know, how many people have been deported as a result of these laws? What are the real effects? Are, are we any safer because of this? Why, you know, why are we doing this? I mean, I think that the notion of waste you know, is really important, but I think that it's, you know, it's not just waste because we're locking people up who would otherwise show up at their proceedings. Maybe they wouldn't. Maybe, maybe if they're ordered deported, they wouldn't show up. The waste is, why are we deporting these people to begin with? Why are we, why are we doing this? And, you know, that's, that's a, a hard thing, a hard task to get someone to take on, but I think it would be really great, Don, if you could <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> somebody to, you know, some social science researchers or a team of them. And at one point I thought, 
maybe we could organize a conference to coincide with the, with the 15th anniversary, now the 20th anniversary, where people would come to the conference and, you know, but, I mean, you want to have these studies. You don't want to just like people talking in papers. You want to have something that would be like a report that would show, wow, this, I mean, you know, and I think that that's where like those groups that, you know, do budget analysis and, and, and say, well, wait a second, and I, I listened to all these groups that I started to call and then at some point I petered out, but you know, I'm glad to work with you on it, Donna, in terms of like, you know, I just think that, I don't know that it's gonna accomplish anything, but at least if people can say, we, you know, we're in a bad financial situation. Why are we wasting all this money on this? And here are examples of, of you know, and, it, and this is where we were talking about it before. There are so many reports that have been written about this. I mean, Human Rights Watch has, has written report after report about the people whose families have been divided because of these laws. So it's not like there haven't been those stories of it. It has to be done in some way where someone will say, wait a second. This is just like, this is, it makes no sense. This is just a waste of money, not to mention, you know, maybe somebody would care that we're deporting these people and separating families. Maybe one more. Uh, I, I'm a CMESO with the Immigrant Justice Court, and Michelle is really nice to see That's you hilarious because I've never met a CMESO before, but I've had five million conversations with him over email. Hi! Well, good to see you. Um, <laughs> I've heard all the and Well, it's good to be back in New York, because um, I think it's obviously where the big picture stuff is going to happen. That's where, you know, your questions come to the fore, Jimmy. Um, so I'm really curious just from the panel to hear to hear your power analysis about who are the people that are going to make these changes. Is it in the Obama administration? Is it in Congress? Is it elsewhere? Um, because at the end of the day, we, we know that this isn't about detention. It's not about deportation. It's about something bigger. And I say that coming you know, after Dili, where there hasn't been a deportation in six weeks. Um, there's been fewer than 100 deportations since it's existed, which means each deportation is costing the government $2 million. Uh, so it's not about deportations. So what is it really about? And my intuition is that it's about foreign policy agendas that if the government actually acknowledges this as a refugee crisis, it confers responsibilities on the government in Central America that they're unwilling to take. Uh, so if they can keep on calling this migration that needs to be deterred, then they're doing a great job. It's more cost effective for one having the sham of detention and uh, keep that myth mythology alive. <coughs> so we know that the government is not listening to facts, they're denying history, they're not looking to the reality of what's going on. So who's our ally or who's the person we need to push um, in order to make this happen, in order to change what's going on? Okay, so we don't all have to answer every question. <laughs> one of us has to answer each question. And you can answer more than one, but you can't answer all four. So just quick responses to these questions and then we'll and, and final comments if you wanna if you wanna make them. Yeah, I'll do mine to, together if I could because um, a couple of the last comments lead me to, to what I wanted to say. I think that a lot of things are changing and and you know, I think in some ways, I, I agree that it's not really about detention. And you know, without sketching the picture too broadly, I think you, you know what it's about is just the changing nature of this country um, in a lot of ways. And and to to go back to the connection between the immigration issue and criminal justice issues, uh, last night one of the candidates talked about the fact that people shouldn't be locked up. Uh, for marijuana use, a Republican candidate saying that, it was kind of extraordinary in, in a certain way. Um, at the same time, Obama said uh, in November of last year when he was talking about the Dreamers that except for the circumstances of their birth, they're as American as his daughters. That's also uh, a pretty dramatic thing to say about the nature of citizenship. So I think that those things are actually changing over time. And I think that if in lots of ways, in lots of different communities, 
uh, um, at, outside a lot of different detention centers, um, people can talk about the kind of discrimination going on against people because they're non-citizens, um, then that might not be change that we see all at once overnight, but I think it is change and it's in progress already. Um, so I'm going to repeat some of the themes that I've been um, foisting upon you here. In the answer um, to the question, what is this all about, I think, um, uh, it's a moral panic. Um, and so we need to treat it that way. Um, what sociologists mean when they talk about a moral panic is when a problem is problematized by politicians and other like thought leaders and whatever to hook into as um, you know one of our Republican candidates is doing so brilliantly um, the, the um, anxieties and resentments of people uh, by using um, you know scare tactics about a population, a problem, or whatever. And so, you know, again, it is uh, like the drug war. Um, and in terms of criminalizing people who, you know, some of whom might have ended up in the criminal justice system, but for the most part, people who were seen as having, you know, being a social problem or a health problem or whatever, not so much a crime problem. Um, and, uh, and so one thing to, uh, that I try to say to journalists, uh, in trying to frame this is because you know I'm so old I can say well I remember when you know back in the day you know before the pr prison boom happened um, there were about 25,000 people uh, behind bars uh, for uh, drugs right um, there are now with somewhere in the upper 20,000s or nearing the 33,400 people behind bars for deportation right? because they are these criminal aliens. Whether they actually are a criminal alien technically under the law, that's, they're all painted with that brush. Um, and, and so, you know, we better look at that, right? Are we going to, in 20 years, 30 years, have two million people behind bars for, you know, and going through the, you know, it's a moral panic and, and, and I think I said, right, the criminal alien has taken the place of the, the whole thing around, if you remember all of what happened, all of the rhetoric that sold you the drug war in the mid 80s with crack, oh my god, it's, it's the most horrible, blah, 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 and now everybody knows, or it's fairly well known that, you know, the crack baby thing was a myth, Right? Nothing, nothing impacted those babies other than the likely poverty of their mothers, right? not the drug, and so on. The other thing it's about, it's about commodification. It's about, you know, you have a problem, we can solve it if you let us make money doing that, right? And in this case, it's commodification of human beings. Um, and that's another parallel with the criminal justice system where you see the same, the same dynamic. Um, and commodification now of mothers and babies and, and so, um, you know, in that respect the parallel may be, you know, Eisenhower's warnings about the prison industrial complex, um, which certainly came to be monstrously true. Um, you know, once you, once commodification comes into the picture, um, it, 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 I like to say, you know, um, uh, defense contractors didn't invent war, but boy, once they get their financial interests in there, then you get, you know, battleships and airplanes that the military doesn't want, and you know, it's, and the parallel there is very close. And what we've got, I think, going in our favor is in terms of, well, two things. One is specific to privatization. There have been public polls. Publish does not like the idea of private prisons or private detention or people making money off, you know, the misery of. Um, and so it's a question of breaking the, 
the, the, the invisibility, you know, turning the two-way mirror around um, and really, um, because arguments will, will hit pay dirt. The public thinks, you know, privatization of prisons just doesn't smell right to anybody, right? So there's that. And then in the larger um, sense, what we have going for us, I hope, um, again comes a lesson from the drug war. Years ago, Ethan Nadelman, who runs the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, pointed out to me, and I'm sure he pointed out to other people, that the, ish, that, that the drug war would wind down because it was, it was a, 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 a moral panic and it was generational. You know, and as the old drug hawks retire, leave government, whatever, stop writing their op-eds in national newspapers. Um, what's left are younger people who really aren't that afraid of drugs, who really do understand that it's a public health problem or whatever. So, and, and I think along, along the lines of what Mark said, you know, this moral panic may also have a generational, stuff gets old. You know, it, it, things that can inflame the that politicians can use to inflame the public for decades, it, it wears out, right? And I think this will too. But we've got to 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 make it visible, you know, to 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 get people to understand that this is just another commodification of misery. And I think you want to hear from Susan last, so have like her words be parting. And I should say also that Asim should be the one up here speaking because he's the one that put in the very hard work of how much, how long were you in Delhi? Yeah, four months. You should be up here. So nonetheless, I will be a poser and uh, and say that, like Judy was was saying, there are two immigration detention systems as they exist today, right? There is a detention system for long-time residents who have come across the criminal immigration um, system or intersection, so the criminal issues have, fate, have made them be placed in these detention facilities which exist all over the country, right? Um, could also be a person who was undocumented for many, many years, right? And then they got picked up because they were undocumented and they have no relief or whatever. So there's that system and then now we have this family detention system that has resurfaced again because we don't learn our lessons as we, have, as we have talked about already. So this family detention system where we're putting recently arriving refugee women and children in Dilly, Carnes, and Berks. I just want to kind of make that clear, like the big overarching detention system as it exists in the United States. Prior to Artesia though and after Hutto, the women and the children who were coming over and seeking asylum were just being given, like they were processed basically at the border, given their documents and told report to your nearest ICE ERO um, office, wherever you're headed, and they were given that paperwork. But what happened was that there was the whole UAC issue that I took me by surprise a little bit, I mean, kind of, not really. I was at Catholic Charities of DC at the time, so there were all these UACs coming across the border. Carmen has seen them where she works here in, um, in New York. And so that made it to the media, right? It was all over the media. We remember that that was all over the TV. That combined with the women and the children, it was so much pressure on the Obama administration because of the political push on immigration reform and DACA DAPA that that's supposedly why they got on board with this very much flawed, failed, inhumanitarian policy. But I wanted to tell you guys too that that's kind of the background of why, and because Judy has brought into play the whole, this is how politics um, are, are involved. Now as far as, I'll tackle Judy's suggestion if I may be a devil's advocate, because I do like to be a, Judy, a, a devil's advocate. I think that your suggestion is great, but I think it's just preaching to the choir. And I think that that's the problem with this country right now, is that to the ones of us who care about immigrants and, and prison reform and all these great issues that are going to make society better are already doing that. But the people who don't care because they either don't know about it or they just couldn't be bothered for whatever apathetic reason, they're the ones that we need to convince. And, how, and I'm constantly struggling as to how we get those people to come on board because only then can we really get this social movement that I think we've talked about social movements to push the policies in this country, right? 
So I would say whatever we do, that we think about that continuously educating, bringing into the realm. I, for one, have not changed my last name and will not change my last name because I want people to ask me where I'm from. And I am from somewhere. I'm an immigrant and I can say I'm from Colombia and then I can start a dialogue and they can see another face of immigration. Why? Because I think that Judy's totally right. There's this uh, commodification, but also combined with the devaluation of immigrant lives. So it's this thing of commodifying everything, right? We're such a consumer-driven society. So we're commodifying everything, including human lives, but at the same time, immigrants have been devalued. And we see that with the term loosey-goosey that we use for everything, as Karen said, which is illegal. Why? Well, illegal harkens criminal. And criminal, well, you know, then you deserve this punishment. And you deserve to have your life be devalued because you have not met expectations societally. So, those are my parting words. Thank you all very much for sitting with us today. So how do we preach? Because you're saying you don't think that my suggestion will work or preach and preach the choir. How do you think that we get those other people? <laughs> Sorry, Susan. <laughs> so, I think that it's going to be a combination of actually getting some of the images that we see of immigrants, of minorities on the TV, um, and doing a lot of this like reformulation of Hollywood in many ways because that's what we feed kids. And I think we start with kids. I think we introduce them to a lot of these issues sooner than later. One of the ideas that we're working on right now is to create a children's book, a bilingual children's book about kids in detention, doing it responsibly. And so kids can start asking, why is this other kid in detention? And just having a very good conversation in a responsible, ethical, child welfare focused way with kids, but bringing up children, because some, unfortunately, I hate to be the pessimist, um, and that's why I wanted Susan especially to, to leave us off on a bang. But I think that a lot of older people, adults, like a lot of us are just really set in our ways and it's gonna be harder to change our mindsets um, but children, we can still do a lot. And I think schools, I think volunteering in the community, I think a lot of also, it's the same type of responses that, um, that we're getting in Baltimore after the how do we get kids involved. Like, a lot of that stuff takes a lot of time and effort, and it takes a lot of money, um, and it's a long-term solution at every level that I, I don't have one answer for that. But it's not that you're saying we should just focus on yeah. The good, the good detainees, the families. You're not saying we shouldn't focus on as well the lawful permanent residents with criminal convictions. You're just saying let's try to aim it at the children. You're not, or are you saying also let's not take those other stories because those were not. Oh no, people. take those stories. Those are my clients. Okay. Those are my clients, and I think we put them all together. We ask for immigration reform that encompasses everyone. Okay. Just from the perspective of being involved in kind of two different efforts, one more successful than the other, I think that um, when I contrast the work that we did on torture and trying to get people to care about the Iraqi torture victims versus the work I've done around the military rape victims, the personal narratives really were the difference. You know, people seeing the human face of suffering in a visual. And one of the things I think that we collectively have to, have to do is use our own language to meet people where they are. And so, for example, double jeopardy. People understand double jeopardy. Yet none of us say, you know, oh, these are people who already served their time that are being warehoused. Right? We use the language of immigration. We need to get away from that. We need to talk in, like, regular terms. Hey, this guy already served his time, and yet he's still being warehoused in prison, right? I mean, that covers a whole group of people. Who's the other group of people? These are innocents fleeing hardship, right? So we need to stop using the technical terms, the governmental terms, and start calling these people what they actually are, and, 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 get, and combat the commodification. I mean, we need to use our own language very carefully and very consistently. And I think that that's a big part of the problem is we all slip into government speak. And you know, I thought the point you made was very, Karen, was very persuasive. You know, over time, we keep listening to this, we're not rebutting it. We're not out there every day on the radio, on the TV, you know, telling people, wait a minute, you've got it wrong. We're looking at, you know, people who've already served their time being warehoused, we're looking at innocence fleeing hardship. You know, that's what we're talking about here. So I think that, you know, I, I think that there's, um, 
a lot of energy for getting it done, and I think that hopefully we can, you know, work together to, to make a change here. So let me just respond to, after that passionate um, presentation, all of them really, um, to some of the technical questions because I feel like we didn't respond to your question on legal counsel and it paying for itself. There is going to be a huge study that, um, that, that looks at that and it's, being, it's in the planning stages now. And I think that the issue is not does it pay, does it pay for itself, is it cost effective? I think the issue is does it lead to the right decisions being made under the law? That's really the issue. It's a due process issue, you know? People should get legal counsel because it leads to the right decisions being made under the law, and due process is a fundamental value. And I think on Will, on your question, how would you characterize IRA, IRA 15 years, 20 years later? I'd say it's when we lost due process for immigrants. I don't know, and I think like, that was something that was exceptional about the U.S., and, it, and it, we ought to be thinking about restoring it because it was always a it was always a value, and it should be a value, and it should come back. And if you start the thing that I'm particularly focused on now with IRA, IRA are all the informal, processless, non-court removals that have taken place that you know are are shocking, and, and it's really the rate of them is, is unbelievable at this point. Most 85 percent now don't go through court. That's pretty phenomenal in a bad way. And then I think, um, Judy, the ATDs, they did they actually did work when community did it. I mean, I can think of three examples when they worked, and with really hard populations, too. They worked with the program for the Mariel Cubans that was in the 80s. They worked with the, the program that was done in New Orleans with the hardest of, you know, people with the most severe kind of criminal backgrounds. And, uh, and those were cases where nonprofits agreed to if people weren't complying, actually hand people over. They did that. They had to. They had to do that, and they did it. You know, and uh, and they worked with the Vera Project too. You know, and that's. They just never, the Vera Project really didn't get to that end part. There was very few people in that study that had actually reached the end. So, and then and then mandatory detention came into being, and then it sort of. Well, the calculation changes a lot, of course, with those programs when they're covering people that are in pending removal proceedings, then after they're ordered removed. Exactly. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. And then I think, uh, but what is the, my takeaway from those programs, one of the takeaways is that legal counsel is key. When people, when, when people understand what they're up against and somebody's encouraging them to go to hearings and actually helping them make their case, they show up. I mean, that's, that's been shown. And I think, um, I think I don't know about power analyses, you know, like I don't, but I do, but I do want to uh, associate myself with uh, what Susan and Michelle said, which I think it is about appeal to common values and in language maybe that we don't always use. And as I look at the uh, unaccompanied children, what I fo what I focus on is um, is not Murrieta, which I think is an anomaly. It's all those communities that have kind of lovingly embrace them at the border. I mean, all sorts of people, hundreds of people came out of the work to to greet those kids, to bring them in, to bring them food, to cook for them, et cetera, et cetera. And not just at the border, but in other places as well. So, I mean, it's not, it's it's a country that I think that you can appeal to, and that's how you do it. You, you, the human face, appealing to common values, describing people as they really are, and appealing to their kind of highest, um, their highest aspirations and values, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. One last comment, uh, easy comment. As we are representing the unaccompanied uh, minors, uh, about a month ago we represented, my office represented a four-year-old at the uh, asylum office for his asylum case. Um, as the officer, as the kid, cutest thing ever, have you ever been arrested? The kid said yes. And the officer just kind of laughed it off and he says yes, I was arrested by immigration. Oh. This is from the mouth of a four-year-old. Um, the only good thing out of it is that his asylum was granted. All right. Well, that's a good note. Let's end on that note. And thank you to all the panelists, and thank you all for being here.